Jesus came into the world as light, to face the darkness on his own. Defeating death, he filled the whole world with life and rose to his royal throne. His mission was redemption, reconciliation, and renewal. Only he could ascend the mountain of God, the mountain we were exiled from. Only he is righteous and blameless. If the curse was exile from Eden and subjection to the power of death, then reversing the curse would be no less than stripping death of power and making a way for exiles to ascend the mountain of God. This is exactly what we see in the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of the King. My name is Kenneth Paget, and this is the Story of God podcast, presented by Wolfbane Books. I've mentioned before that you can easily recall the grand story of the Bible if you just memorize a handful of mountains. Let me show you again as a way of keeping the big picture in our imaginations as we approach the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus in this episode. It all began in the mountaintop garden of Eden. This was the very good, the tov me'od, beginning that God spoke into existence. He established for himself a people and a place. They would dwell together on his mountain as the people grew and flourish, cultivating the land. On the mountain of Eden, heaven and earth overlapped and interlocked. And in Eden, God planted a seed that was meant to blossom into a global garden city filled with billions of people dwelling forever in the presence of the one triune God. The story starts on a mountain the mountain of Eden. But Adam and Eve choose to disobey God's loving laws, and they are exiled out of the garden. As humanity heads east and down the mountain of God, death consumes generation after generation. But they press on in their rebellion. It all comes to a head in Genesis 11 at the great and terrible city of Bavel, east of Eden. It is here where humanity, united in their defiance and disobedience, attempt to erect a rival mountain, the Tower of Bavel, the mountain of man in the midst of the city of man, a gross perversion of the city God had envisioned in the beginning. And he will not have it. He confuses the people and scatters them across the wild world. Two juxtaposed mountains, Eden and Bavel, bookend the introduction to the biblical story in Genesis 1 through 11. But the response to Bavel isn't just scattering judgment. God will not let his story end in tragedy. He is good. And he calls a wilderness wanderer named Abraham and promises to bless the scattered families of the earth through his offspring. Somehow, God will use Abraham's family to gather up the rebel nations and bring them into God's presence again. Abraham is brought into a lush land in the west and ends up on Mount Moriah with his son Isaac. It is on this mountain where we learn that God will provide a substitute sacrifice, a faint intimation of how the holy God will make a way for sinful people to live in his presence. As the story moves forward, we see that Abraham's family, now called Israel, is rescued out of slavery in Egypt and brought to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God in the wilderness. It is here where God commissions the people to build the tabernacle, a mobile mountain filled and flowing with all the same wonderful sights and smells of Eden, a great tent situated in the very center of the Israelite camp. For the first time since Eden, the glorious presence of God is once again in the midst of his people, burning bright as an all-satisfying source of life and light. Generations after the Israelites return to the promised land, the tabernacle gives way to the temple. King David laments that God dwells in a tent while he lives in a palace 
His son Solomon builds the tabernacle on Mount Zion, a mountain we've already encountered in Abraham's story. Remember, Mount Zion was once called Mount Moriah. They are the same mountain. God, the creator king of the cosmos, rests on his throne on the mountain of Zion, in the midst of his people, in the holy city of Jerusalem. What a wonderful reality. But we know what happens. The people of God choose to disobey God's loving laws, and they are exiled out of the lush, promised land. As humanity heads east and down to Bavel, which is also known as Babylon, God's presence departs the temple on Mount Zion. The Old Testament ends with a handful of Jews returning to Jerusalem. They are weeping because Yahweh is not present in the newly erected temple. But prophetic words of hope carry them through continued exile and occupation. So the mountains of Eden, Bavel, Moriah, Sinai, and Zion can help you recall the Old Testament story with a theological focus on God's presence with his people. And yes, there are other very important mountains that could be added into the mix, like Ararat and Carmel, for example. But what about the New Testament? Does the mountain motif continue? Well, we saw in episode 8 that Jesus ascends the mountain in Galilee and gives divine wisdom and instruction to Abraham's offspring, a clear reference to Mount Sinai. In Mark and Luke, Jesus chooses the twelve disciples on a mountain. In the fourth chapter of John, Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman at a well, a discussion about which mountain should be associated with the worship of God. Perhaps the most fantastic mountain in the Gospels is the high mountain of transfiguration. Here, Jesus is suddenly surrounded by a dazzling light. His clothing is bright white. Matthew says his face shone like the sun and that there was a great luminescent cloud overshadowing them. Moses and Elijah appear in glory, two figures associated with mountains in the Old Testament. And they are talking to Jesus about his great exodus. Three disciples accompany Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, one of whom is Peter. He recalls this moment in the first chapter of his second letter. He says that he and the other disciples were eyewitnesses of Jesus' majesty, that they heard the thundering voice of Megalopripos Doxis, translated the Majestic Glory, capital M, capital G. All of this, according to Peter, happened on what he calls the Holy Mountain. Let us also not forget the numerous times where we read about Jesus ascending various mountains to pray in solitude. Even Jesus himself communes with the Father on mountaintops. If you have ever been to Jerusalem, you will know that the mountain across from the Temple Mount, from Zion, is the Mount of Olives. The Gospels tell us that on this mountain, Jesus told his disciples of what was to come in the last days. As they look across the Kidron Valley to Zion, Jesus tells them of the coming desolation and destruction of the temple. This teaching is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse. So, we can see that in the Gospels, mountains remain an important theological feature, all associated with God's presence and purpose. So, it works like this. The God of the Bible is a mountaintop-dwelling God. Of course, he's omnipresent, but in this great story, he is associated with mountaintops. And I hope you're seeing that. Humans originally dwelled on his mountain. When we were exiled, we went down and away from God's presence. When he pursued us, he met us on mountains. Even his tabernacle and temple were modeled after his holy mountain. Mount Zion and Jerusalem become the locus of God's presence in the Old Testament. If you want to meet God, or approach his presence, you will need to ascend his mountain. Then Jesus, who is God with us, comes and instructs us from his mountain, brings his disciples to a mountain to see him in his majestic glory, and himself meets with God the Father on mountains. So, I want to ask perhaps the most important question ever asked. Let me say that again. Here is the most important question that the biblical story leads a careful 
reader to ask. And King David is the one to ask it. And he asks it twice. It is found in Psalm 15 and Psalm 24. Listen to the first verses of Psalm 15. Yahweh, who can dwell in your tent? Who can reside on your holy mountain? Hear the first three verses of Psalm 24. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to Yahweh. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of Yahweh? Who may stand in his holy place? Have you ever thought to ask this question? Who can ascend the mountain of Yahweh? I'm hoping that you're seeing that this is the question that fallen, broken exiles should be asking. How do sinners get back up the mountain of God and dwell in the presence of the megalopripos doxis, the majestic glory, the all-satisfying source of life and light? Well, I have bad news and good news. Bad news first. Let's hear David's answer to this question from Psalm 15. Yahweh, who can dwell in your tent? Who can reside on your holy mountain? The one who lives blamelessly, practices righteousness, and acknowledges truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue. He does not harm his friend or discredit his neighbor. He despises the one rejected by Yahweh, but honors those who fear Yahweh, who keeps his word whatever the cost, who does not lend his silver at interest or take a bribe against the innocent. The one who does these things will never be shaken. Psalm 24 gives a very similar answer. The answer is that only the righteous one may ascend the mountain. Only the blameless can reside in God's holy place. So, is that you? Is that me? Are we blameless? Are we unstained by sin? No, we are not. We cannot ascend the mountain of God. On our own, we would be doomed to wander in the lower lands. This is the bad news. Adam disobeyed and humanity was exiled off of God's good mountain. Ever since the nations have been scattered and confused, exiles wandering a world filled with dust, danger, and death. But hear this. Hear this good news. Hear the best news the world could ever hear. Jesus is righteous and blameless. The answer to David's question is that famous Sunday school answer. Jesus. Jesus can ascend the mountain of God. He came as a man, what the Apostle Paul calls a new Adam. He succeeds where Adam failed. Adam was our head, the representative of all humanity, and his failure doomed us all. If we are in Adam, we die in exile. Jesus comes as a new head, a new representative for all humanity. If we are in Jesus, we forever flourish on his mountain, in his presence. Jesus travels to Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, the place of death. He enters that place for us and our salvation. On the cross, the son of Abraham is lifted up. He reverses the curse of exile in order to bless the families of the earth. The righteous dies for the unrighteous, so that we may dwell on the mountain of God once again. This was all prefigured in the sacrifice on Mount Moriah, in the Passover feast, in the tabernacle and the temple. Remember that the tabernacle and temple were modeled after Eden and Sinai, and moving deeper into the temple was like ascending the mountain of God. Listen to episode 5 if you need a refresher. The peak of the mountain, the place where God's presence dwelled in majestic glory, was called the Holy of Holies. In the temple, there was a partition, a curtain, a veil, adorned with the image of cherubim. Remember that the cherubim were the guardian angels at the entrance gate of Eden that prevented humans from entering after the exile. 
This veil was meant to conceal the Holy of Holies from outsiders. Only on the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, once a year, could the high priest pass through the veil and enter the Holy of Holies as a representative of the people. All of this was pointing to a new high priest, a new representative, a new righteous Adam, and a once-for-all sacrifice. The tabernacle and temple show us that God will make a way for us to dwell in his midst. He will allow us to ascend his mountain, but only in Jesus. While Jesus was on the cross, he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama azavtani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus enters into our exile, he cries our cry, lamenting the separation. Of course, Jesus is calling our attention to Psalm 22, a psalm of David, who though afflicted and suffering, continues to trust that God will ultimately save him. David goes on to say that indeed Yahweh does not remain distant, that in fact he has not hidden his face from the afflicted. He hears the cries of the exiled nations. David says that, quote, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Yahweh. All the families of the nations will worship before him because the kingship belongs to Yahweh and he rules over the nations. Can you hear the echoes of the Abrahamic promise. From Genesis 12, God had promised that he will draw the scattered families of the earth back into his presence once again. David knew this. And as Jesus quotes this passage from the cross, he knows what he's accomplishing for the nations. In the sixth hour, darkness covered the face of the earth, and the Creator's loud voice rang out as he gave up his spirit. The Greek words for Jesus' loud voice in Matthew 27.50 are megas and phony. Like a cosmic megaphone, Jesus' voice broke the darkness, shook the earth, and as his life passed from him, and as he enters death for the sake of the exiled nations, the veil in the temple is ripped in two. In him, the way up to God's all-satisfying presence would be unhindered. Matthew gives an account of the dead being released and sprouting up in the holy city like a new garden. Like Adam being born from the ground, these fallen saints come forth from the earth, reborn in the resurrection. This unusual moment in Matthew 27 is only a small taste of the new creation that will come on the last day. And at Jesus' death, the first cry of faith comes from a Gentile soldier. At his birth, foreign kings bring him gifts. And at his death, a Gentile soldier declares his true identity and calls him righteous. Three days after the cross, we find ourselves in a garden. It was in a garden that death began its reign. And it is in a garden where death is defeated. Again, like Adam coming forth from the ground at the launching of creation, Jesus, the new Adam, comes out of the ground at the inauguration of a new creation. The sting of death has been removed. The curse of exile has been undone. In Jesus, and only in Jesus, the way up the mountain has been opened. United to Him, we can ascend the mountain of Yahweh. After the resurrection, in Matthew 28, Jesus takes his disciples to a mountain in Galilee. I mean, where else but a mountain, right? And he tells them that he is the king of heaven and earth. Remember that line from Psalm 22? Kingship belongs to Yahweh and he rules over the nations. He tells his disciples to begin to gather up the nations, the scattered families of the earth. And then in Acts chapter 1, on the Mount of Olives, he tells them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the farthest part of the earth. Then he ascends to his heavenly throne with the promise that he will return. <laughs>
So I want to say here that there is so much that could be said about the death of Jesus on the cross. I have obviously not explored all of what it accomplished for us in this short podcast. But my goal has been simple. We were made to be in God's presence. Because of sin, we were exiled out of his presence. In Jesus' death and resurrection, that exile is ending. And we are able to be with God again. The Bible tells us this story with a mountain motif. And thus, so did I. Too often, we hear about Jesus' death without the context of the grand story God is telling in the Bible, or at least with an extremely truncated version of it. My hope is that hearing the account of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension ten episodes into the story has illuminated it in fresh new ways for you. We have two more episodes left in the story, and I'm really looking forward to exploring how this wonderful story ends. In the meantime, I pray that you and your family have great discussions about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and how we might respond to this radical good news. This episode of the Story of God podcast was presented by Wolfbane Books. Please visit us at wolfbanebooks.com or on social media at wolfbanebooks.com.